<laughs> you can't get here without a mother. It can't be done. It can't be done. If you didn't have a mother. And some of us think uh, that our mothers are mean. <laughs> and I know my, my mother had her moments, but only when I was bad and refused to listen. My brother was a little insolent with her, and she said to my dad, what am I going to do with this kid? He said, hit him in the frying pan. <laughs> true, it's true. She didn't do it, but that was the recommendation. And uh, my brother uh, took care of my parents in the last years, and uh, we all think of my mother as a sweetheart, and she's the one that told me that I should be sorry for my sins and I should love God. And I said, don't preach at me, Mom. I didn't accept that, but his words never left me. Some of the things your mother tells you will never leave you. Mothers are awesome. You think about, you know, all the mothers in the Bible. You think about your own mothers and grandmothers. The police recruit was asked, what would you do if you had to arrest your mother? And he said, I call for backup. <laughs> mother's tough I'm gonna need more help than just me doing that but you know you think of these great awesome mothers in the Bible you think of Peter's mother she was dead and after she was raised from dead she, she waited on them I mean she just got to work you think of, of Mary Jesus mother and we don't worship her like some do but she's an honored woman in all of our memories and uh, there were so many but on Mother's Day you think uh, I think about Eve and um, can you imagine how grieved we never think about this Eve would be when one of her sons murdered another one of her sons we think about the sons and that story but can you imagine what was going on in her, going on in her heart when one of her sons one of her little precious baby boys grew up and murdered his brother can you think about that grief that was going on in her life you think about noah's wife we don't even know her name but she was for a second time the mother of all mankind eve being the first all mankind is reborn again through her and we don't even know her name you think about Sarah, how desperate she was to have a family. That she suggested that Abraham father a child through her Egyptian servant Hagar. That's desperation. And Abraham did it. He fathered Ishmael through Hagar. And when Ishmael was about 13 years old, Sarah then became pregnant in her old age, and Isaac was born, and there's been trouble between the descendants of those two brothers, half-brothers, ever since. I think about Lot's wife, and she, we don't know her name either, but she didn't trust God enough to obey, and she became, she looked back at Sodom, and as you know, she became a pillar of salt. You think about Naomi in the Bible. Her husband and both of her sons died in a foreign land. They went there because of the famine. They went to this foreign land and she became destitute and childless. Her two sons died. And I think about her daughter-in-law, Ruth, who would not leave her. I will not leave you. I will go where you go. I will, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And she married Boaz, a wealthy landowner. And she became the grandmother of King David. Happy Mother's Day to Ruth. Amen. See, this is a sign. Can I have an amen? So when I put that up, I get an amen. <laughs> And my, my amener isn't here today, so. And now I think about Hannah. The title today is Hannah's Prayer. 
And she was grieved that she was childless. And when God did bless her with a son, Samuel, she gave him, dedicated that is him, to serve at the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Now think about that. Hannah gave her son, whom she was so desperate for, to serve the Lord, only seeing him once a year. I was not able to determine how far it is between Ramah, where they lived, and Shiloh, where they went to worship in those days. It must have been a considerable trip. They only went there once a year, and that was during a festival. And they went there to sacrifice. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 24 to 28, it says, After he was weaned, it's talking about Samuel. She took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought them and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. Eli was the priest who was ministering there at the time, uh, along with his two sons. And she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, <clears throat> as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Can you imagine? Hannah was desperate for this child. And there was a particular reason for her desperation, not just for a child but she gave him to the Lord at Shiloh and she'd only see him once a year who would do that very few who would do that be desperate for a child and then as soon as he was weaned take him all the way to Shiloh and leave him there who would do that can you imagine what kind of a heart of gratitude she had well, the boy's name was Samuel. And God blessed her after that, and she had three more sons and two daughters. God had closed her womb, it says, uh, and that's why she didn't have children up to that point. But she was desperate for that. And Samuel was the last of the judges in the period of judges and the most powerful of Israel's judges. He was the one who would anoint Saul as a king and would anoint David as a king of Israel. When Saul came around, people were afraid of him. He was a powerful man, a powerful ministry. And they lived in what they called the hill country. If you look at a map, like a reef map, you'll see there's a lot of mountains around uh, Ramah where they lived. And the Israelite villages um, built by the settlers of Canaan were on hilltops. The Canaanites were there first, and the Israelites displaced them. These villages were quite small, maybe 400 people in the largest of these. And in Shiloh, for instance, or Gibeon. And these towns were mostly unwalled, though they were part of larger political units or regional chiefdoms uh, that provided security. The Israelite villages within a given region were subjects of the major town of the area, some of which, like Shechem, were very large and controlled considerable territory. The Israelites lived in a nuclear household during the time of biblical judges, often <clears throat> with their relatives in clusters of houses around a common courtyard. This is a kind of culture that was going on at that time. The houses were made of mud brick and stone uh, and a sound foundation and perhaps a second story made out of wood. The living space of the houses were, had three or four rooms and often they had sleeping space on the roof or a covered loft on the roof. One of the first floor rooms was probably a courtyard for domestic animals sheep and goats 
And at that time, the judges, the biblical judges, at the time of the judges, the hills were densely overgrown, covered with a thick scrub of olive, uh, oak, ter terebinth trees, and it was often too rocky even for the sheep. So raising animals never stood at the forefront of the economy. Instead, the early Israelite settlers, settlers of Canaan would burn off some of the brush, they would terrace the hillsides, uh, within an hour's walk of the village, and they would plant grain, primarily uh, um, lentils, garbanzo beans, barley, and millet. And they had orchards on these terraces as well. And I think the orchards probably were where they grew olives. Olives and olive oil were really important in the culture at that time. So Hannah's everyday life would have consisted of sharing the household duties with Penina. Penina was a rival wife. It was, it was her husband's, Elkanah was her husband's name, and that was the other wife. She probably helped with Penina's children. Penina had children and she didn't have any, which was a source of stress and grief to her. So she probably had doing the cooking and cleaning and fetching water and going to the market and bringing home food and um, people worked hard in those days, hard. She probably had to cook stew and bake bread, harvesting grain. We know that Hannah could sew. We know she was able to do that. Hannah gave Samuel after he was weaned, which would maybe be three or four years old in those days, to serve God all of his life. And every year she would make a new set of clothes and bring them to him at Shiloh because he would grow out of the old ones. Kids grow. Did you ever notice? <laughs> Their feet grow. You got to take them to the shoe store in the fall and get a new pair of sneakers and stuff like that. But anyway, she made him a new set of clothes. And that was the one time a year that she got to be with her son. So what was life like for Hannah? What was her life like? She was married to Elkanah, who had another wife, Penina. In those days, that was a common practice. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Penina teased, mocked, and tormented Hannah. That was what we call bullying nowadays. That was life for her. For a woman, not able to have children was a considered a shameful thing in those days. They would, they would call her barren, a word we think of as referring to a landscape where nothing will grow. And this torment went on for years because Penina had several children and Hannah had none. So it had to go on for a few years. The only bright spot for her was that Elkanah, her husband, loved her dearly. We don't know which of Elkanah's wives came first. We don't know if Penina or if Hannah came first. We don't know that. It doesn't say. But it seemed that Hannah lived in constant torment. She had to live in the same house with her tormentor. She was constantly confronted with the children of her rival. Hannah was desperate. She was completely unable to do anything about it. Unable to escape the desperation of her torment. Can you imagine the emotion of how she felt? This went on for years. Her rival would mock her and jeer at her. And then I can imagine her children started doing the same thing because you kind of do what your parents do. You kind of adopt their attitude. And I can imagine her kids were mean to Hannah as well. So every year Elkanah, both of his wives and the children would go to Shiloh to sacrifice to the Lord. At that time, the Ark of the Covenant was in Shiloh, and there was a tent of meeting there in Shiloh. And uh, Eli was the priest in charge, and his two sons were there, but that's another story because they were bad. 
But anyway, he was in charge. And one of these trips, we'll read it from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1 from 3 to 17. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty. At Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. That's a clue as what life was like to her for years. For years this went on. It says, verse 7, this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Can you imagine? the turmoil, the emotional turmoil that was going on within her. But her husband, in verse 8, Elkanah, would say to Hannah, Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? His trying to help really wasn't very helpful. You know, I mean, that, what else could he do, you know? But it says in verse 9, Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And her deep anguish, that's another clue of how tormented she was, deep anguish. I don't know if I've ever been in deep anguish. I don't know. I've been in shallow anguish, maybe. But this is, this is deep anguish. And... In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Did you ever weep bitterly? There's weeping and there's weeping bitterly. She was really, she was really emotional. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, this was her first prayer. Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and do not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Do you remember the other time when no razor was used? That was the vow of the Nazarite on, on Samson, Samson's head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Her lips were moving and enunciating, but she wasn't saying the words. There was no volume that came out of her voice. It was not heard. And Eli thought, because she was acting like that, that she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Remember, he's, the, um, he's in charge. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Where should we go in our deep distress but pour out our soul to the Lord? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Without even holding up the sign, I got that. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Not so. She said, not so. And she said, do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered and said, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. So they went home and the Bible says in the course of time. Don't know what that means, but she became pregnant and gave birth to a son in the course of time. We don't know what that means. We don't know. We can assume it's quickly, but I don't know. But it was when God ordained it to be in his sovereignty, course of time. God does everything. His timing is perfect. He does everything exactly correct. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> he does. So happy Mother's Day, Sarah. I mean, Hannah, Hannah. She finally had her boy. 
What a happy reversal. Her fortune is completely reversed. No more shame, no more torment. She became a mom at last. Her, her rival couldn't tease her about not being able to have children anymore. So here's Hannah's prayer. This is a prayer of praise and gratitude in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Verse 11 verses, Then Hannah prayed to the Lord and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my heart, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. Remember, when Hannah prayed for a child, she prayed in silence. Her lips were moving, but no sound. And Eli uh, noticed and thought that she was drunk. And now she's praying out loud because she's praising God. And she doesn't mind if people hear her praising him. The enemy that she's talking about is the rival wife, Penina, who would have provoked her because she had no children. You know, it could be that her children were tormentors also, but now she is standing up, praising God out loud instead of that quiet, anguished prayer. She has the joy of her heart spilling forth in praise to God. There is no one holy, verse 2, like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. This is pure praise. She had been desperate to become a mother. Only God could bring an end to her desperation. And now that he has done it, she returns praise to God. Her gratitude is coming forth in that. And she's honoring him aloud and before other worshipers. She's bringing him praise and honor. Verse 3, do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance for the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. Who she was talking to there was probably Penina. She was probably, Penina was probably in her, able to hear what she was praying. So her tormentor that had several children, that's who she was talking to there. You know, the, the tormentor's deeds are weighed and the tormented one is finally vanquished here. And verse 4, the bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. She's comparing those who have no recourse except to God to those who are uh, leaning on their own abilities. The biggest, boldest, I'm skipping a prayer. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but who has had many sons pines away. There's a complete reversal of her fortune here. At the hand of God, the reversal of fortune comes. The biggest, baddest, meanest becomes the weakest. The weakest, hopeless, helpless, become strong and victorious. Only in God does that happen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Only in God. Hannah has been on both sides. Both sides, the agony and the ecstasy. She's been the hopeless one and now she's the vindicated one. And it comes forth in praise to God. Verse number six, the Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. Hannah recognizes that all life and death are in God's hands. From the moment of conception to the last breath, God is sovereign in every life. Even the ones that don't accept or believe in him. He is sovereign in every life. Verse 7, the Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and exalts. Verse 8, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Picture Job 
in the ash heap. And his friends weren't much help. And his wife wasn't much help. But he refused to curse God. He refused. And he came up out of the ashes and God restored him. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. So picture the rising and the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar praised himself above everything else and God humbled him. He became, a, he became like an animal. On, going around on all fours, eating grass. And he became like an animal. And he was that way for a while. And then when he came out of that, he praised the God of Israel. Picture the rise of David from a boy shepherd to a warrior king. These are reversals. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Picture Solomon, who would begin his reign hiding in a pile of baggage when they were going to anoint him as the king. Hiding in the baggage. He rises in splendor and then he descends into idolatry. Influenced. He was warned not to have foreign wives. And he was influenced by them and he erected idols at the temple for his wives and they influenced him and he even worshipped them. And we probably aren't going to see Solomon in heaven. He descended into that. Verse number 9. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in, this, in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Verse 10. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So there's a prophecy. Hannah is a prophet here. In her prayer, there is prophecy. There is a revealing of things that will happen. And they did. She counts herself as one of the faithful servants. We only have a tiny glimpse of Hannah's life. But both times she goes to God. She went to him in prayer. For a, for a son, for a baby boy. And then, did she have a life of prayer? Probably. Probably. And she, but she went to God in her times of torment and despair. Did she do that for years? Probably. Probably. God was her refuge and her strength. During all her years of torment, no one on earth could help her. No one. Sooner or later, we all experience trials. We get into places, things where nobody, nobody on earth can help us. And some of us just stay in the despair and others throw themselves onto the mercy of God and yield to his sovereignty. And sometimes he brings people out of things and sometimes he doesn't. But we yield to his will. We yield. Hannah had a life of prayer, I believe. I believe. But such is life. The question is, does the things that are against us bring us to God? Does every obstacle in our, in our life, do those things that torment us and, and bring us down into despair, do they bring us to God? Maybe they're meant to. It says God closed her womb. It says that. He closed up her womb. And then he blessed her. When he, when he closed her womb, she went to God and prayed for a son. Prayed with such travail that she was weeping. And her lips were moving, but no sound came forth. And when she got the son, she went to God and uttered this prayer. This prayer. 
In verse 11, then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. That's an awesome, that's an awesome story. We can learn a lot of things from that about being grateful and humbling ourselves before God. In her prayer of gratitude, Hannah doesn't cite health and beauty of the boy. She overlooks the gift and praises the giver. She isn't saying anything in this praise about how awesome the gift was. She is saying how awesome the giver was. She is so grateful. God himself has enabled her to triumph. Not only triumph over the physical inability to have a child, but to triumph over the torment of the rival wife. God had enabled her to rise up in victory. And she's given him the glory. She's praising him out loud in the hearing of all the people compared to the quiet prayer that she was doing before. Gives him all the glory. There's none beside you in verse 3. No rock like our God. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Scotty. That works pretty well. He's, Scotty gave me this. <laughs> In her prayer of gratitude, it's all focused on praising God, on praising the giver. In her case, it was the giver of life. Can we praise God with Hannah? For his holiness. We praise God for his holiness. Can we praise God like Hannah. For his single uniqueness. There is no other like you. Single. Unique. The only one in all of eternity. Can we praise God with Hannah for his dependability. She utterly depended on him. And there are times when we have nowhere else to turn and we can depend on God. Can we praise with Hannah for his justice? He brought her justice. He brought her vindication. Can we praise God with Hannah for his sovereignty? He's God and we're not. We like to tell him, we like to tell him how to do things. Lord, I want you to fix me this way. I want you to straighten my path of life out this way. Remember, he's the one that closed her womb in the first place. It brought her to him, weeping. And then he opened it and blessed her so awesomely. But he does things his way and he does them in his time. And we throw ourselves on the mercy of God. And we ask for healing. And we can trust and be sure that healing will come. But it might come in eternity. Some folks aren't satisfied with that. No, Lord, I want you to heal me now. I want you to take away my sore back now. I want you to heal my ribs now. And he will. But maybe not now. Maybe now. Maybe not now. It's all up to God. He's sovereign. Can we praise with Hannah? We praise God for his awesomeness. We can't even embrace or, or get a grip on how awesome God is. We can't get a grip on how large he is, how enormous he is. I like to imagine sometimes that I'm, you know, I'm praising God and all of a sudden there's no roof anymore. And I'm outside and the building's gone. And I look up and God's magnificent presence can be seen all around the entire, as far as the eye can see, beyond the mountains and the hills. His, his glory, his awesome, awesome glory. And yet... He loves you and me individually. And yet, he sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for my sins and for yours so that we could move in with him, 
in eternity. We get to move in with God. How awesome. How awesome. How awesome that is. Could we, could we uh, do that last song again? That, pra that was a praise song. And let's, and let's praise God with this song with a heart of gratitude for his awesomeness, for his mercy, for his... his